Why wasn't the press conference this afternoon about the single biggest public safety crisis in Texas? As a mayor of a Texas city, I'm proud that city stepped forward when the state would not effectively to stop the virus back in March. I don't know where the state was. Cities led and helped save thousands of lives. As a mayor of a Texas city, I'm, 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 I'm proud that cities were not hesitant to demand and to make mandatory the wearing of masks to stop the virus spike back in June. I don't know where the state was. And by pushing for that action, cities help save thousands of lives. You know, there's a runaway infectivity rate in large parts of our state right now. And our leadership should be focusing on that, on keeping thousands of Texans safe from their most immediate threat. The press conference today was not about facts. It presented no plans, it presented no data. It was about trying to make us scared, of frightening us, and of furthering lies. It's really a shame that some feel the best way to reach people is to peddle fear, trading in fear, to avoid having to actually engage in real policy conversations is a sickness that I hope we turn away from in November. I'm sure we're gonna see more and more of this as we get closer to the election in November. It's a bad thing, and I hope the voters turn away from it. We shouldn't be distorting the facts to make people scared. Now there was mention in that press conference about a Wall Street Journal article from about a month ago that said that uh, Austin uh, had the, the highest rate of, of increased homicides. What that article also said was that Austin had the second lowest homicide rate of major cities in the entire country. The second lowest, even after the increase. Three of the, of the top seven cities in terms of victories are Texas cities. But among all the cities, sec, Tex, Austin, second lowest, almost irate. Austin is a safe city. So let's talk about the facts. What did the Austin City Council do? We cut $20 million. It's about 4% out of the police budget. About the same, I understand that, that the governor requested be cut from the DPS budget last session. About $20 million was to have more money to spend to help people out of camps and tents and into homes. So our police shouldn't be spending so much of their time being social workers and, and, and interacting with this community. We expanded EMS so that they can make more medical calls and divert some calls for police. We increase the sheltering so that women can leak, so women can leave abusive situations before they become a crime statistic. It was to expand mental health first responders so that being the mental health first responder is not the continuing responsibility of the police. How did we pay for it? The $20 million? We cut about four or 5% of the police budget, only going after unfilled positions. There was a haircut on overtime and we delayed three academy classes. It's important to note that we did not lay off any officers. There was no detrimental impact on emergency response. APD's own internal review said that we shouldn't do more classes until we fix some curriculum and cultural issues. What did we not do? We did not cut $150 million of police functions. Three buckets, the $20 million bucket I just talked about, 
a second bucket with $80 million. It was to move certain functions to civilian control and a more independent status. No function was ended. No function was reduced. The city council voted to not take a penny away from any of these functions. The forensic lab, after two years of study and, and, and two consultant reports, looking at the recommendation to take the forensic lab and make it independent so it would have more credibility, could work better with the DA in Travis County. No one suggested taking a penny away from 911 response, but, but integrating it with 311 so that we could make sure that calls were handled efficiently and quickly, and they always got to the, to the best place that the calls could be routed. Right might even end up with a tax savings to our taxpayers. No one suggested we take penny away from support services. It doesn't seem to be that that needs to be handled by a, by a sworn officer. Internal affairs still needs to be a police function, but, but maybe independent and so that it's not in the same chain of command that it has the responsibility to investigate so that its conclusions and its results have the highest level of credibility in the community. That $80 million bucket did not involve the end or the cutting of any police function. The third bucket was $50 million. These were not cuts. These were not things removed from the police department. In fact, there was no decision made as to if, whether or not, these functions should be changed. But we have started the work already taking a look at those functions. Does it need to be a sworn officer with a gun who's taking noise and sound measurements downtown outside of clubs? You know, officers certainly have to serve as adjunct professors in our academy, but does the academy need to be run by police officers? Would it be better? Would it be a better deal for taxpayers and a, and a better system for the community if the academy had civilian oversight and civilian control within city government? Those are the three buckets, 20 million, 80 million, 50 million. There were $20 million in cuts, about four or 5% of police budget. Why did we do that? because safety is our primary concern, keeping our community safe. And that means safety for all. That means it has to involve a conversation about justice and about equity. It's not just about George Floyd. It's about the fact that George Floyd is not alone. It's not just about reforming and, and, and changing and, and training because Minneapolis was doing a lot of both. It's about redefining public safety into a conversation that centers on the safety of the most marginalized among us. It's recognizing that public safety is also about healthcare delivery and the delivery of opportunity. If this virus taught us anything, as we have sat at home and watched the disparate impact among communities of color in our city and in cities across the country. It's that we have been doing something wrong for a really long period of time and we need to fix it. It's about culture. It's about reimagining. And it is about trust. It's about Black Lives Matter. It's about searching for the promise of finding and institutionalizing justice. It's about making us all more safe. Thousands of Austinites marched in the street demanding justice and action. The status quo and the past are no longer good enough. This is the inflection point, and we all have a decision to make as to which side of history we choose to be on. If the governor wants to have a conversation about policy and public safety, 
what we need to do to make us safer. And I'm ready to engage. We've been waiting. You know, there is a reason why Tesla has come to Austin to invest over a billion dollars and, and Apple just before and the United States government with the Army Futures Command all choosing to come to Austin. And it's because we are a wonderful community that takes care of one another. One of the safest big cities in the country, a beautiful city with great people. About 5% of the state population, but a third of the patents and half the venture capital. All of our cities in this state are great but for different reasons, we need not all be the same. Our state should be celebrating and learning from its cities rather than threatening them and trying to change them. Together, our cities help make our state stronger. And to my community, I say, your safety is our highest priority. And your, in that sentence, means everybody in this city. Those that have historically felt safe and those that have not. We do that by becoming a more fair and equitable city. We do that by making justice part of everything that we do. Gloria, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you, Mayor. We have a few questions. We'll get started with the first one. It's Jennifer Kendall from Fox Austin. I quote, you have said cutting the APD budget is a way to make the community safer. However, police officers feel like this was a targeted attack on their profession. If the end goal was to reallocate money for other safety projects and programs, then why was APD's budget the only one on the chopping block? Why wasn't a city audit done to find other available money to fund safety projects? First, I want to say that this was not punitive, nor was it an attack on our police officers. We have exceptional police officers in this city. And we're very proud of the work that they do, and we rely upon our police officers. You know, at the city council budget session, I talked about policing being a profession where, where all police seem to be judged by the conduct of some. And it seems to happen in this profession more than any others, and it is not right, and we wouldn't stand for it in other professions. I remember watching our police officers run toward the bomber a couple years ago when everybody else was, was, was not. This is not punitive or directed at our police officers. This is trying to find a way to make our community safer, recognizing that, that police is but one aspect of being able to deliver public safety to a community. A significant part of our general fund budget is the police department. It's the largest department that we have. It was also the department that had the greatest number of unfilled positions. We started cutting and other departments were letting people go and were firing people. And the goal in the cuts that we made, funding EMS, funding, taking people out of tents and into homes, increasing EMS capacity and, and, and increasing first responder mental health professionals are all designed to enable our police to have more time to be able to focus on doing the work with crime that our community needs to do and that our police want to do. Thank you, Mayor. The next question is from John Engel at KXAN. Do you believe the state has the legal authority through future legislation to retroactively punish cities that reduce police budgets? I don't know the answer to that question, and I haven't seen the proposal. It was okay. just, I, I don't know much about it. Okay. Next question is from Jordan Bonke at CBS. Speaker Bonin accused you of flip-flopping on this issue, citing a 2016 press release in which you allegedly said SB2 would cut 15 million from the city budget and put residents at risk 
by resulting in fewer police officers and longer response times. Did you say that? And if so, how is cutting money from APD okay now when it wasn't then? I think that the state's action in limiting the amount of revenue that cities could raise uh, if the local community decided it wanted to raise that money and if it had priorities that it wanted to expend resources against. I think taking away that, that, local, that local freedom uh, to be able to make those kinds of decisions does make cities less safe. If we had more funding and, and more opportunity, we'd be able to do a better job right now of being able to take people out of, out of tents and out of camps and putting them into homes. And I know that if we could do that, we would have fewer demands on our jails and on our police officers and on our EMS and on our emergency rooms. I think what I said when I was at the legislature was, is that the kind of cuts they were making could result in fewer police officers. But at that point, I didn't know what it was that we were doing. So I, so I, I think that I was pretty careful and not promising what would happen because I didn't know. But what I did know was that it took away from communities the ability to decide for themselves what were their priorities and how they wanted their communities to operate. Okay, the next question is from Jacqueline Powell at KXAN. In the governor's press conference, Dennis Bonin said in 2016, you put out a press release concerned that Austin would lose 15 million if property tax reform were in effect, because that money is needed for public safety functions, including police, fire, and EMS. He then compared that to the 150 million the city is now cutting from APD and questioned how, if 15 million wasn't acceptable in 2016, 150, 150 million from the police budget is now. What is your response to his comments? Can you confirm you were concerned about the 15 million in 2016? To say that the city of Austin cut $150 million out of the police budget is not true. To say we cut $150 million of police functions is not true. So the, the, the premise of the question uh, is, 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 is not true. What I did say was that if the state limited the amount of money that cities could raise, if their communities wanted to do that, that it could have an impact on public safety. I specifically talked about police and fire, but also EMS, because we are not expanding EMS as much as we need to expand it, because we don't have the resources to do it. But, but taking people out of camps and into homes is also about public safety. Having, having mental health first responders is also about public safety. Sheltering women so they can leave abusive homes is also about public safety. Public safety is more broad than just police and EMS and fire. It's about making sure that people have health care opportunities. Public safety involves a lot more. And that is part of the way that our city and other cities are going to have to frame public safety if they want to be just, and equitable, and the safest cities they can be. Next question comes from Christopher Neely, Community Impact. You have refused to refer to what Austin City Council did last week as a 150 million cut, sorry, 150 million dollar cut to the police department's budget. Some of your council colleagues have previously called it such. Are they wrong? Lastly, is this the police department's budget 150 million dollars less than what the city manager initially proposed? And if so, please explain how that is not a cut. There were only uh, 20 million dollars that were cut. $20 million for unfilled positions, for overtime, and for three cadet classes that were postponed. There were no other cuts. Uh, the forensic lab will continue, 911, 311 will continue. Uh, the internal affairs will continue. None of these things were cut. 
And again, as I said earlier, in those three buckets, the third bucket, there wasn't even a decision that those things should be moved out of APD. It's something that we're taking a look at now. So yes, I disagree with the characterization that there were $150 million in cuts. It's not true. Next question is from Audrey McGlinchey at KUT. Do you think this law would even stand a chance of passing? What would you do if a law like this was passed? I haven't seen the law, and I don't know what the legislature is going to look like after November. I hope it looks different. Uh, so I'm not going to, to, to speculate on, on what happens. Next question comes from Kristen Caps at Atlantic City Lab. Does the mayor foresee the cap on property taxes being a problem for the city if the governor's legislation is passed next year? I think that any kind of cap that's imposed at the state level and local communities is a problem because I think it takes away fundamental and basic freedom rights uh, from, from, from local communities to be able to decide what their priorities are in that community, what they want to do in that community. You know, we have all kinds of different cities uh, in this state. And, and, and one of the most wonderful things about the job I have is being able to work with mayors and cities all across the state, both Republicans and Democrats, uh, when we support one another. Even when our values or priorities are different, we support one another. Uh, and I think that's the, the, the best way that our, that our state could be run, recognizing that measure of, of, of local freedom for communities to decide their own priority. Next question is from John Engel at KXAN. Were you given any warning about this proposed legislation? No. Next question is from Audrey McGlinchey at KUT. What are possible unintended consequences of such a measure? She has also not seen this proposed legislation. It's curious to know. I don't know. I really haven't had a chance to, 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 to look at it yet. So it's really, and I don't even know if there is a written something associated with this. I think the press conference was mostly about trying to make us afraid and scared. Uh, and my concern is that we're going to see more and more of that the closer we get to November. Okay. This last question is from Kristan Caps at Atlantic City Lab. He says, this is not the first time that Governor Abbott has preempted a policy in Austin or announced a policy that specifically addresses Austin. What is your response to this preemption? Again, I think I've, I've talked at length about the importance of having local communities being given the freedom to be able to, to set their, their priorities so that different communities can, can gather and and, and reflect the, the values and culture uh, of those uh, uh, individual cities. Uh, but I do see that over time, it's appearing to me less that uh, there's people gunning for uh, Austin and more just gunning for cities generally. Uh, and you see that not only in Texas, uh, but you see that in other places around the, the country. Right now, cities, I think, are the incubators of innovation uh, in our country, that are the, 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 the economic uh, generators uh, in our in our state and in our in our country, uh, cities make our states stronger, uh, and I think cities will have the best opportunity to make the greatest contribution to our states. Austin will have the greatest ability to make the greatest contribution to the great state of Texas if we're able to take advantage of and grow those attributes that make this city special. Okay, Mayor Adler, thank you so much. That was our final question. Thank you everyone for tuning in and for sending in your questions. Until next time, we'll see you soon.